What's up guys, I'm Ari Rochelle and this is Nuggets of Truth. So in our last video, we spoke about God the Father and his role in the Trinity and, his, and the different names that he has. In this video, we're going to talk about God the Son, whom we know as Jesus, and how he is a part of the Trinity. So let's just get into this. I think one of the most important things to establish when it comes to Jesus is that he was, he is, and always will be God. So one of the two of the most important verses to explain that Jesus is God is John 10 verse 30. And it says, I and the Father are one. After Jesus made this statement, the Jews who were there picked up stones to stone him. And so he asked, I've done a lot of good works from the Father, so which one of these are you going to stone me for? They then responded, not for good works, but because you are a man, you make yourself God. So Jesus then went on to explain that he could not be blaspheming based on their scripture and the fact that he is the son of God. So Jesus was saying, I and the father are one. I am the son and he is the father, but we are still one. There's only one God. The other verse is John 1 verse 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So fast forward a few verses to verse 14, and John reveals that the Word is Jesus and it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth so the word of God is Jesus and the word of God according to John was with God and was God so let's keep going Matthew 3 verse 16 through 17 further explains who Jesus is it says and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So we know that Jesus is the Word of God, and he is the Son of God. So what good is knowing that he is the Son of God? So Second Peter 1 verse 17 tells us that for when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased so in other words it's saying that Jesus has to be God because God doesn't give his glory or share it with anyone else how do we know this Isaiah 42 verse 8 I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Isaiah 48, 11. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. So Yahweh is the one who's speaking in both of these verses, whom we know from our last video is the Father. So if the Father and the Son are not one, the scripture would contradict and there would be no reason to believe because throughout scripture the father shares his glory with the son another verse to further prove this is john chapter 8 verse 54 jesus answered if i glorify myself my glory is nothing it is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our god another verse john 17 verse 1 when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. So the father is glorified in the son and the son is glorified in the father. So they are one and the same, yet they are separate so that they may glorify each other. So not only does Yahweh say he doesn't share his glory with anyone, but he also states that he is our only Savior. Isaiah 43 verse 11. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Another, 
Hosea 13 verse 4. But I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. Now in the New Testament, we see that Jesus is our Savior. Titus 3 verse 4 through 7 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Another verse is Acts 5 30 through 31. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So here we are again and another contradiction unless Jesus and Yahweh are one. Okay, so I'll give you another example. Yahweh is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. We know this through Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And in Isaiah 48, verse 12, Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I called. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. Yet when we get to the New Testament, Jesus was referred to as the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha, and the Omega. So Revelation 1, 17 through 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Again in Revelation 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. And again in Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. See, Yahweh sums up the Alpha and the, the Omega, the first and the last, and the beginning and the end all into one name. He says he does this in Exodus 7 verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. See, Jesus does the same thing in John 8 verse 58. It says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. All of these different names are the same and the same meaning that John 1 verse 1 through 2 is saying, Jesus is, he was, and always will be God. Before there was anything, there was God. When there was nothing, there was still God. God does not cease to exist. God does not have a beginning. That is why he is, I am. Because there's nothing before him, and there will be nothing after him. He will never cease to exist. So we've seen that Jesus is the Son in the Trinity, but who is He in relationship to us? Well, He's our High Priest. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 through 6 says, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself as a ransom for all which is the testimony given at that at the proper time. Again, in Hebrews 4, verse 14, it says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. And again, in Hebrews 5, 9 through 10, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, Jesus is our high priest. And what does that mean exactly? In the Old Testament, a high priest was the one who represented the people before Yahweh. They 
brought the sacrifice before him, first for themselves and then for the people. But when Jesus came, he was the final high priest who brought a final sacrifice himself. Hebrews 7 verse 26 through 27 says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have a, such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So Jesus didn't have the problem that he had to sacrifice for himself first because he had no sin. So neither did he have to continuously sacrifice yearly for the sins of the people because his blood washed us all clean. So that's important because before we were unable to enter heaven because we were still damaged. We were still filled with sin even though the high priest of those days was were sacrificing it only put off the judgment whereas when jesus died and rose again we were completely washed clean once we accepted his salvation and i talk more in depth about that in our video sheol under the category too deep so let's keep moving on so Jesus is also our connection to the Father as a high priest would be. John 14 verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again in John 16 verse 23, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So Jesus as the new and final high priest has torn the curtain or the veil that used to separate the common folk like you and me from the father so that we can go to him with all of our troubles and concerns through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior as a high priest Jesus also intercedes for us John 8 verse 34 says who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And 1 John 2 verse 1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding and advocating for us as our high priest. So let's just let that sink in for a second. Jesus, the Son of God, takes time to intercede for us. Just let that sink in for a quick second. If you don't feel like you have anybody who is praying for you or is looking out for you, you have Jesus, the Son of God, who sits at the right hand of God the Father and literally is advocating on your behalf. So just, just think about that. So Jesus is also our savior. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they brought death into the world, spiritual death and physical death. So we were destined for death through Adam, but we were given, given life through Jesus. So Romans 5 verse 18 through 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Again in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Not only does Jesus bring life and, re and reverse the sin that Adam brought on mankind, he also delivered us from our sins. So before Jesus, we were under the law. And that didn't wash us free of our sins, but simply pushed them off for another year. So this is explained in Hebrews 10 verse 4 through 11. For it is 
impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor had taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Galatians 5, 1 ensures us that through Jesus Christ, we have been freed from all chains of sin. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Romans 6, 6 through 7 goes into further detail saying, We know that our old self was crucified with him, Jesus, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So through Jesus' death, we have overcome sin. We have crucified our sinful nature with Christ and no longer are enslaved to sin. We no longer have to give in to sin, but instead we can overcome sin. We can be released from our sin no matter what sin it may be. It may seem impossible. It may seem like you're the only one, but 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 assures us, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way to escape, that you may be able to endure it. So he gives us the ability to endure through our temptation without giving in as Jesus did in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan three times. We're then, we're then reassured in James 4 verse 7 to resist the devil and he will flee. James writes, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So this is because our Savior Jesus created the only way that we can be forgiven and cleansed of our sin. If you want more details on why he had to die and why it's his blood that washes why we needed his blood to wash us clean, check out our video, The Blood Under Our Nuggets of Truth category. So let's keep going on though. So Jesus is also our friend. We have the privilege of being a friend of the Son of God. John 15 verse 15 says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Luke 7 verse 34, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus is our friend. He takes time to sit and speak with us. He doesn't place himself high and mighty, even though he could because he is. But instead, he came down and became a servant. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men so jesus set down his godliness and became man so that he could be our kinsman redeemer and doing that he opened up the way for us to be a friend of god if you want more details on how jesus is our kinsman redeemer and what all that means you can check out our videos kinsman redeemer under our nuggets of truth category but anyways onwards we go 
um, John 14, verse 14. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So now we're at a friend status with God and we can ask him for help in anything and he'll help us. So not only did Jesus become our friend, but he also became our brother according to Hebrews 2 verse 11. For he sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Matthew 12 verse 49 takes it a little step further and says, And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. So why is it important for Jesus to be our brother? Well, because a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17 verse 17. So a friend loves at all times, but when it boils down to adversity, to difficulty, to hurt, to pain, that's when you need a brother. That's when you need a sister. That's why Jesus says, yes, I am your friend, but now we have grown even closer and I've become your brother. I will be there with you through adversity, through trials and through tribulations. Jesus doesn't just leave us at a friend status, but he lifts us up to being a sibling. So in conclusion, though Jesus is entirely and wholly God, he came down to earth as a man to redeem, restore, save, befriend, and build a sibling relationship with us. Jesus is the only path to the Father. So in our next video, I'll go over the last member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And until next time, God bless.